The second is, it turns out that sometimes negativity isn't the worst thing in the world. So I'll give you a taste of this. So this is a little machine we call a home cafe. Anyone have a home cafe? It's a single serving coffee maker. There's a Senseo, a couple of these things. Do you have one? Do you have this one? Do you like it? Mixed. Okay. That's real word enough there. Mixed. Okay. So, so here's what happened. We ran a program in 2005 for Home Cafe. We had about uh, 3,000 people who signed up for the program. We got in and we sent them each a machine. Now they all go home, they plug in the machine, and 60 of them light on fire. <laughs> so we're a little worried, obviously, if people are lighting on fire. Um, now this is happening all across the country. Um, this wasn't just fuzzy, but you now have these groups of people who have. So what do we do? Now you think this is possibly the worst thing ever, right? It's, just, it's pretty bad. Now this this machine is made by P&G. P&G certainly has seen things good and bad over the years. So how do they handle this? Well, the first thing is they now have these people who raised their hand and said, I am willing to help your brand. So these people are waiting to give them some help. So the first thing P&G does is they reach out like a real world focus group. Can you read the serial number on the back of this machine? They find out within hours exactly which pallet and which factory has manufacturing issues and they stop shipping. The first thing is they're able to stop things very quickly. The second is 50% of negative word of mouth comes from a feeling of injustice on behalf of the brand. I'm going to say that again because it's really important. 50% of negative word of mouth comes from a feeling of injustice on behalf of the brand. This means that it's not so much the product or service or offering you have, but how you treat the person around you. Right? I have a Dell computer. I call customer service. They treat me like crap. I don't want to talk to them again. I bought it with a battery issue. They fix it. These guys are great. Right? So they immediately sent all these people new machines. It was not even a question, not even, you know, how are we sure it's your machine that's on fire? They just sent them out. Many of these people in this campaign became the most outspoken positive advocates there could be because the brand chose to take care of them. The last thing is really the most interesting though. This is a pattern we see all the time. So when negative word of mouth gets really loud, in this case, people were stopping consumers at the point of sale, don't buy that machine, it's gonna light on fire. They were they were writing things online, they were saying, you know, the machine would cut you if you used it, people were making stuff up, it was terrible. But what happened was there started to be this group of people who came out to protect the brand. You know, yeah, come on, that's this is ridiculous. It's not about you. They had a manufacturing issue, they fixed it. It's a great machine, I have mine, they send me a new one, it's really good. And we call these people quiet advocates. People who would never say anything positive, they'd never really become outspoken, but the minute there's anything that's really negative, they will come to support the brand. And these people, we've seen this in hundreds of campaigns, these people will always show up, and they will always be the most powerful people because they're gonna help offset another consumer saying something negative. So if anything ever does happen, badly for your group. Um, look for these people, you will see them, embrace them, help them learn how to help you solve the crisis. Okay, the last thing about word enough to make sure that you're doing is to disclose. As I said, um, you know, you've got to make sure that people are open and honest about their involvement in any type of campaign. Um, this is a snapshot of a report that was created by Northeastern University. It's called To Tell or Not to Tell. What they found was Telling people that you're involved in the Word Enough program actually is good for marketing in general. It's, it's helpful, you're showing trust, you're engaging. This, this thing proved, though, that if you do that, your Word Enough travels twice as far than if you don't. So if you try to hide that you're, you're helping a company, you're helping a brand, your Word Enough goes so far. If you tell someone, oh, I'm involved in this thing, yeah, I got to join, it was really fun, they told me what they wanted me to help with, your Word Enough goes twice as far. So the practical value of disclosure is very important. It's not only good for trust, but it's really important for making your word not programs work. Okay. Okay. So one question here a lot of people ask is why is this happening? Why is there word of mouth going on all across the country? Why are people signing up for the system? Who would do this? This is crazy. So so show hands who might sign up for a system like ours. Okay. Show hands who never do this. Come on, you're out there. All right. Only one brave person. Come on. Okay. All right. So this was this is sort of a question. Why are people doing this? This is this is ridiculous. So this is a picture of actually our first campaign when we started this business in late 2001. Um, I went out to 10 companies, offered our wonderful service to them. They all politely declined. So I offered it to five of them for free, and four of them said no. 
<laughs> One company said yes, Penguin Publishing. They said you can work on this book called The Frog King. Um, what this is is a little picture of the instances of word of mouth that we created with 400 people who volunteered and said, yeah, well, I guess I'll help this book, why not? Now, that, this book did its entire year sales in the two months of our campaign. Okay, now we figured out over time how to turn this into media, and we turn it on and off for specific products and programs over time. So this is a snapshot of word of mouth across campaigns. The question is, all these people doing this, 220,000 people are doing this, what's going on? So, here's why, okay? This is an advertisement from the 50s, okay? Bad off cream, this is wonderful obesity cream, okay? It's really worth it, I promise. Um, now let's look at it next to something like this. Okay. This is Hoodie Up, everyone is getting those emails from Hoodie Up about um, reducing weight. This is real. Now this is the exact same app, 50 years later, okay? Looks a little different. It's exactly the same, right? This has a little more icing on TV and trust and whatever, but we're being told the same thing over and over, and it's really hard for us to believe it anymore. Can it really work? Come on. This can't work, right? So the concept for us as consumers is, I'm not sure I can believe what markets are telling me in all these channels, because everything's perfect, everything's great all the time, everything's gonna do what it says it does, but I know it doesn't. The next worst thing that happens as it relates to the soy weight loss here, um, we've got KFC advertising that you need Kentucky Fried Chicken is good for you. Okay. It's really good. This is a major national advertising campaign. They're, they're comparing to a lot of them, they say, come on, it's only three grams per piece, you should eat buckets of it, you're going to lose lots of weight. Now, we all know what the truth is, right? And KFC is fine, but it's not your weight loss mechanism, right? So they run this for a couple of weeks in the children's advertising review unit, finally comes and says, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, you can't air this, so they take it off air. But the damage has been done. Again, we've been fooled, we've been you know, deceived, right? And because of that, we're stopping paying attention. Uh, this is from uh, McKinsey. By 2010, traditional TV advertising was one-third as effective as it was in 1990. One-third. That's not because we're not seeing it, right? You, you know, there are other tools out there to not see TV, but because of this, because of this deception, it's no longer having the same amount of effect. Right, now here's what some marketers decide is going to make sense. They're going to do product placement so that they can capture us when we're least thinking about it. Now this is product placement in a cartoon, okay? For all those people who are going to buy reach toothbrushes from this, I don't know how this happens, right? This isn't solving the crisis. This is just kind of, you know, subliminally fool us, right? So why is this happening, okay? This is from one of our agents. This is pretty typical. Everyone's a buzz agent in theory. I'm just lucky enough to benefit from the practice, right? I do this anyway. Now what we found when we ask agents, come on, why do you know, what's this all about? What they talk about is something we call social currency. It feels good to know about things and to share it with others. I like to be the first to know, I like to help people. I love to give my opinion. And I feel like my friends think that I know more than they do because I know about things, right? The idea of sharing an opinion or giving one or accepting one is about social value. It actually is worth something to talk about product services, associations, communities, whatever it is. So when you talk about engaging word of mouth, it's part of this process of giving people something so that they feel good when they talk to others. All right, so let's talk about measuring word of mouth. This is really an important thing that we need to understand as we do this for lots of companies, and certainly as you do it, um, very important to know is it working. Okay? So there's three ways to do this. There's something we call Net Promoter. This is something every one of you can implement tomorrow and will change how you look at your business, I promise. Um, comparative ROI, so return on investment, and what we call generational ripples. So let's look at the first one, Net Promoter. Okay, so Net Promoter scoring was created by this guy, Fred Reichel. He's the father of loyalty marketing, works at this big consulting firm, Bain Consulting. Wonderful guy. He's written books for years on loyalty. Okay, so loyalty rules, loyalty effect, made his name in this. Um, he came out with a paper about three years ago, where he, which, which he put out in the Harvard Business Review, where he said, I got that all wrong. Thanks for buying the books, but it was all nice. <laughs> the reality is if you ask a customer if they're loyal, they don't know what that means. Right? Am I loyal to this association? I don't know. Am I loyal to Starbucks? I drink it every day. Does that make me loyal? I don't know. But if you ask a customer or somebody, would you recommend this to somebody else, we immediately know what to say. 
So what Fred did is he started ranking people's responses on a scale of 10 to 0. Fred, from 10 to 0, would you recommend this? Um, and what he found was people who were 10s and 9s and call promoters, they would actually go out of their way to recommend something. People 6 and below were detractors. They may not say anything bad, the zeros would certainly say something bad, the six may not, but they wouldn't really help the product in any way. What he found was, if you subtract the detractors from the promoters, you get a score. His median score across 100 industries was 16, and the movement of that score dictated future sales. They actually showed you whether or not you were gonna grow, whether you were gonna shrink, whatever you were gonna do. You proved yourself over and over and over. It's really simple. Anytime you ask your, your uh, members anything, anytime you ask people around you anything, would you recommend us to somebody else? That would be a great gauge of whether or not you're succeeding in what you're doing. And I promise you it works. We've done this for a lot of associations ourselves. It absolutely works. So this is an easy takeaway. If you take nothing else from this, take this away. It's very, very good stuff. Okay. Second is um, for us is ROI metrics. In our world, we absolutely have to prove a uh, return on investment. Everything in marketing right now is about uh, getting a return. So we do a lot of things where we actually do control markets versus markets where there's word of mouth. Now, this is a campaign we did for Dunkin' Donuts for Latte Light. And this is really interesting. We took four markets uh, with word of mouth. Um, and, and all other traditional media going on. We did four markets without it, but all other traditional media was still going on, and the markets with word of mouth did 26% lift in sales. Now this is really important because it means that we're not the replacement vehicle for all this other stuff, but we're the stuff that accelerates it. Right? Traditional media is good at generating awareness, it needs credibility to succeed. So you can actually generate lift by doing the things you do every day and then adding consumer dialogue to that. Right, very important. Okay. So the last way we measure word of mouth is like this. So this is um, this is a picture of ripples in a pond. Um, someone dropped a rock or did something, maybe it was raindrop. So we think of traditional media like the rock. Okay. The rock dropping into the pond, how many people are going to see this message? Now we all know what happens to a rock when you drop it into the pond, it sinks. Right? Now it doesn't mean the traditional media isn't very good, it just means that it's a one time event. You drop it, everybody's supposed to pay attention to it. The value of today's world are the ripples. How many people are going to go out and communicate with somebody else? And I'll put this into practice for you. So this is how most marketers value their medium. Okay? How many people are going to read it? How many people are going to see it? Um, you know, you know, this is the rock, okay? I can get, you know, whatever my rating point is on Fox. So because that million people are going to see it, of course they're going to pay attention to it. Now we know that's not true. You know, you've got things like TiVo out there. You know, I, you know, you're going to ignore it. You're going to do whatever. But even if you do see it, what happens from there, right? Now let's talk about the ripples. The ripples are the important part. So this is a picture of a billboard from McDonald's. This is a, uh, a shake. It's upside down. There's a straw. That's the pole. Pretty innovative. Right? How do you know when you have ripples? You get a guy like this. Whoa! Check that out. I got to tell somebody else, right? The goal is how do you create stuff that someone has to go out of the way to tell somebody else? Some other ideas of this that I love, I have no idea who made this. <laughs> I always wonder if she's drinking the cup at a different angle, what happens. Right work. Um, this is one of my favorites, so you know, what's this, what's this thing? Nice little keyhole thing. <laughs> okay. So so how do you create things like this, right? When you're creating whatever it is you're doing, if you got this on your door, you would tell like five people. This is, this is so fun to put this on the door instead of a little flyer that they drop into your mailbox, right? So that's the ripples. You want to figure out things that are going to get someone to turn around and tell somebody else. Now, how do you measure this? So this is the methodology of the future when they talk about how they're going to measure these types of new mediums like word of mouth is what they're going to talk about. G0 is the first person to engage in a program, the rock, so to speak. G1 is the first person they talk to, generation one, generation two is the next one, generation three, so on and so forth. So marketers are going to value their campaigns by how far out they can get generational ripples. Now we've measured this over time. Each person who joins a volunteer program to learn about a product or service and help will typically tell about 18 people over 12 weeks. Right? Now this isn't life changing, meaning they're not like waiting on the corner to tell somebody about something, but really in everyday dialogues. When the right moment presents itself, the right idea comes up, they'll tell 18 people, they'll have real discussions, huge amount of value. Each G1 turns around and tells about 1.7 G2s. Okay? 
Okay, so that's when someone when someone's heard the message, they'll turn around and they'll tell somebody else. Nobody knows G3 and beyond yet. There's studies galore going on out there. But what this means for marketers is that 10,000 volunteers, big scale volunteers, can generate half a million communications. Right? So this is a real, true media form. Right? It's got scale. It's got real dialogue occurring. People are paying attention to it. And in the end, you want to think about whatever you do, whatever you're creating, is it going to generate ripples? That's the important thing. Okay. So last case here, which is really important, I think, what we're probably all in the middle of every day. When we started this business, we had a theory about who was generating word mouth. Anyone read the tipping point? Tipping point? Influential? Okay. So there was this idea out there that certain people were creating all the word of mouth that everybody else paid attention. Um, the Influentials is a book that says one out of every ten of us tells everyone else what to do. Okay? Now, that, that feels pretty good for the one, the rest of us. <laughs> but this was really out there. They were called connectors, or mavens, or sneezers, or alphas, or bees. All these wonderful terms that if you find these people, they're the rock in the middle of the pond, the ripples will take care of themselves. Now, we believed this when we started our business. We said, yeah, that, that makes sense. Sounds good. It's sexy. We can sell it to people. It's going to be great. Um, so we set out actually early on to prove this because we wanted to help show that we really had created this, this program. So we actually ran a campaign for a restaurant um, called Rock Bottom. There's 30 of them in 15 states. And what we did, we partnered with Harvard Business School to measure what was happening. And what they did is they measured the amount of word of mouth coming from certain types of people next to the usage of a loyalty card. So they could actually tie it to sales. This person's creating this much word of mouth, here's how sales are moving per individual. And our goal, again, was to prove that we were going to create um, an influential network, and that's what was important. So the first person, they broke it into four categories of people in the system. The first category was the influential or the trendsetter. This is Seth. He's the cool guy. He does a great shade. Um, we love Seth. Now, there was a lot of people in our system who liked Seth. He met all the criteria of an influential. He read more, he volunteered more, he belonged to more associations, he traveled a lot, he did all these things, right? So he comes into the campaign, he joins, gets his rock bottom card, he goes out, and he doesn't really create any sales. Right? Now that's not, he's not trying to create sales, he doesn't create any word of mouth that leads to sales. When we ask Seth why, you know, what happened? All these guys like this here, why, why, you know, why aren't you helping? Well, yeah, I am, you know, I am more connected, but you know, I've got a reputation, and I, you know, I only talk about certain things. He was very difficult to engage. And when he did engage, the information didn't spread any further than anybody else. So we immediately told Harvard Business School they were wrong. Um, they fought us for a while and then we realized they were right. So, so in any event, we found the trendsetter wasn't generating the next level of value. So we went to the next person. This is Dwight, who's what we call a heavy loyal. Um, <laughs> Dwight's been to Rock Bottom 427 times. He's had 1,812 pints of beer. That is true. This is a real person. Okay, That's not really Dwight, but you know, okay. So there are, this is what, we, what a lot of us would call the evangelist of someone who's so passionate about a brand that they, they, you know, they embrace it every step of the way. So we get all these Dwights to join, and they don't do much. So we finally go out to Dwight and we say, hey, you love this brand. What's the problem? Two issues with engaging people who are overly passionate. The first is they're likely to have told everybody around them already. So can you accelerate anything? Unlikely doesn't mean they've done, they haven't helped but you're probably not going to get anything more out of them. The second is that Dwight said, all of them said something relatively similar. I kind of love this brand so much I don't want to tell anyone else. Right? Ever have this, you like something so much you, kind of, you don't want to tell somebody. So this can happen to people who get so passionate about something they'll stop telling other people. Um, so the third group we looked at were what, what are called the maidens. These are people who are experts. In this case, they're people who wrote reviews for restaurants, um, you know, maybe they're considered the foodies, they're the friends, they always do, you know, the next thing. This is Mario Vitelli, for those who like Iron Chef. Iron Chef, what was it? Yeah, okay. He wasn't in the campaign, but he looks cool. Right? So, so, but there were a lot of people who fit this name and profile. And when we ran the campaign, they actually created quite a bit of impact. The problem was they only did it for two weeks. Right? And then out of 12 weeks, they only did it for two, and then they stopped. So we went back to these folks and we said, well, what's the problem? They said, well, my job is to continuously find new things. I'm an expert at food. I will talk about Wash Bottom for a little bit, and then I move on. 
So in the case of what some of you do, you may want to consider that. If there are people who are experts at associations or joining things like this, they may continue to move from place to place and will only help you for so much time. So we looked at the last group. Okay? This is what they call the light loyals. This is the group that Rock Bottom never cared about at all. Now, if you ask them that, they never say it that way, but they really didn't. This is what we, they would consider as the sort of bottom of the consumer, you know, customer relationship list. You know, yeah, they, they only showed up to Rock Bottom a few times. They never really did anything. This is Mary. She's a light oil. Um, she's been to Rock Bottom three times. She's had seven beers. They never really paid attention to her. All right. So they, they invite, they were lots of them, to be clear. They invite Mary into this program, and all these people start engaging. Okay. They go out, they talk to others around them, they pay attention, they get new people to sign up, they, they go and they talk to everybody. Now, we couldn't believe this data when it came back. We run this about a hundred times, the same study over and over, and we found the same pattern, which is these people are the people you want to pay attention to. They've got a few things going that can help. They haven't influenced the network around them, so they've got a lot of people they can influence. Right, that may not have any idea. They have no reputation issue. They, they don't really care whether they're considered a foodie or, or cool or not. They just want to share good ideas. Um, and the sort of most important part is most of us aren't really conscious of the things we talk about every day. Right? We don't pay enough attention. She didn't even know that she really liked Rock Bottom until they reached out. She was like, well, yeah, yeah, Rock Bottom, sure. I mean, we had that thing on Friday at work. I'll invite everybody. So she created, and all the other light loaders created all the difference in this program. Now, some stats on it, she generated 1.2 million above trend in sales, increase in card sign up, increase in frequency of visit, increase of spend per visit, all the metrics went through the roof, solely because of what we call everyday people. So you have, in your groups, all these people. You don't have to wait for somebody special, they're all here, they're all waiting to be paid attention to. Find them, engage them, get them to be involved, you will generate change, I promise. So last thing here, and then let's move on to some questions if you guys have them. Um, when companies come to us, we talk to them about what they need to do to figure out how to engage word of mouth. Right? We talk about things like starting the market with their customers instead of at them. Right? Let them involve themselves in what you're trying to do. Don't just try to push stuff on them. Um, but the most important thing is give your people some tools. Let them know you want any help. Give them things they can talk about. Get them to be involved. And then most importantly, get out of the way and let them do what they can do best, which is talk to each other. Okay, so thank you. Questions, comments, ideas, issues? Perhaps, perhaps there are questions. Yeah. The thing, uh, how the wind market mm -hmm. is, what I think we should have how do we, instead of either, Talking to or even down to our, our donors or to the constituents we serve. How do we somehow market with them? Right. It's, it's, it's pretty simple in the long run. Tell them what you're trying to accomplish. Right? In a lot of cases, it's you know it's sending stuff out to them, you know, sort of push a new a new thing you're trying to do, and it's a lot of sort of pushing act. Right? We hope you take part in this. Right? We hope you come to this event. We hope you you know buy this or do whatever. Instead, bring it in. We're trying to figure out how to create this research book. Can you help us? What is it that you care about? Right? How should we maybe bring it to people in your organization? Do you care? Right? It's all, it's all about sort of that question of. Of do you care, right? Do you? And of course, people are like, yeah, they want to be heard, right? It's all about social currency. They want to know they're being listened to. They want to know they're being involved. That they're making a difference. So, I guarantee, change your messages a little from trying to sell people on stuff to try to get them to help you develop it, and their whole pattern of behavior around it will change. All right, what else? Yeah. It's very clear when you're Right, so the, the question is, you know, we can do this for, you know, anheuser Bush, that's pretty easy, or, or some company like that. How do you do it for an organization? So our business has done this actually for quite a bit of associations. We have a program um, which we run every year called Good Buzz. We donate our services to three nonprofits every year. 
So we've done March of Dimes, we're doing something for Lupus Foundation now. Um, we've done things like Knowles, the National Outdoor Leadership School. And it's relatively the same process, right? You find people who care about the cause in some, some way, shape, or form. You let them experience it. And by experiencing it in an association, it's what are they trying to accomplish, right? Because we want to help others. So look, this is an association they've been struggling you know, to, to focus on premature babies for March of Dimes. You know, a lot of people don't know what this is about. Can you, can you really help, right? People want to help associations, they really do. Um, and so we engage them, we give them some education, we give them some experience, this is what it's all about. And then we, that key to it is, when people tell us what they've done to tell somebody else, we appreciate it. We tell them what worked, what didn't, what we liked, how amazing they really helped, what, what they're doing has changed, what they're thinking. Sometimes if they give an idea that's really going to help something else, we tell them, right? I can't believe you just thought of that when you told someone else. We're going to tell everybody else who's in this program, right? Make people feel really good that they're having a difference. Um, the same thing will happen. So um, I see it as very much similar to any package good. It's figuring out, finding the right people, letting them engage, and then telling them what they did was really powerful and helped you quite a bit. Microphones, right? They want you to use the microphones. Yeah. I just want you to talk a little bit more about how you do that follow-up. Do you do it word of mouth again, or do you do it on paper or email or whatever? Right. So how long? Right. How long? So in our system, um, and this is this is you know why companies hire us to do this as opposed to trying to figure out a lot of it themselves. And there's an easy way to do this, but our system. It's a technology platform. Individuals who sign up for the campaigns can then log into their account and fill out a form. Those, those narratives that we get all go into this pending queue of people who read them and then reply. And they do that all through technology. But you guys can do it very simply through email, right? You know, email us what you're thinking, but you've got to have someone at the other end reading those emails and truly responding. It's not automated. It's not, you know, thank you, we'll get back to you. It's, hey, that's really cool you mentioned this. Um, I, I love that your brother joined. Sounds like a great guy. You know, I wish I had a brother like that. Blah blah blah. Right? But it is. It's that personal stuff where people, you know, it's about emotion, right? People feel that they're really talking to somebody real and getting getting involved. That's the big difference. Um, so, so you can do it very easily. Start with email, things like that. Um, you know, and just just start having the dialogue. You'll find people change their tone very quickly. What else? Yeah. What can you do to encourage constructive negative response? We've done some outreach to our audience with volunteers, not staff, and everybody loves everything they're just busy. Right. They don't want to tell you the bad things. Now that's that's actually a great one because um, that's really hard. A lot of people, especially for this type of industry, you know, they don't they know you're trying to do a good thing. Right. Very easy to say this beer is terrible or this car doesn't drive well or whatever. But no, we know you're trying to do a good thing. We're going to tell you how great it is. Um, I, I guess I'd have a couple, couple of tips, and we saw this a lot actually in the program we run where we couldn't get enough negative stuff. Um, tip one would be tell people, I don't want you to ever report anything that's possible. Right? We know you love us, but the only way you're going to help us is to tell us where we can work on things. Do it anonymously, give them an, an alias email address, give them something where they don't feel they're like outing you and you're going to read it and then they're going to. They're going to never want to see you at an event again because they'll hate them, whatever, right? So give them an opportunity to, to take out all that positive, you know, make it, maybe even do, for the next week, only tell us negative things. You can tell us all the positive things again. We really need to know these things. Um, sometimes examples really help. So when people hear negative word of mouth, they think um, the G6. That car sucks, right? That's what they think. What, they, what we talk about negative word of mouth is a lot of products, you know, have something like, it's a great product, tastes really good, but it's really expensive, right? Or I don't like the packaging, it tears when you open it, or you know, the, the organization never got back to me, but overall they're doing a good thing, right? So try to make sure it's clear, this isn't just about how terrible you are, but about the little things you might be doing that you need to work on to make all the good stuff better. Yeah. Okay. What else? Other questions? Come on, I couldn't sign in this audience. Yeah, and anyone, yeah. Either or either. Here. I have a question about figuring out how much information to give to engage the other party without having them sort of glaze over and <laughs> lose you. you know? Right, it's a sales pitch. Yeah, like I don't want to hear this. Yeah, that, that's actually a really good key. One of the things we spend a lot of time on educating these people for is 
that they aren't salespeople. They're not going to read from a brochure or tell you all the things. But it's we, we provide people what we call a buzz guide to help them get into the mindset. It's about the right moment, the right thing, right? So you do all these wonderful things for the entire year for your group, but this conversation I'm having over here might be only about one thing, about great events. And so that might be kind of just talk about the great events that you're having, not about all the other membership benefits you have. And so what we, we educate people are is think about the right people to talk to, think about the right moments, and don't go out of your way to sell anybody. This isn't, this isn't like getting someone to buy today. It's about having that real dialogue that's going to get someone to think about the things that are important to them. And so that you will find, if you have this dialogue with them, if you set up this email thing where you're, you're going back and forth, you'll have to actually train out that behavior, right? You'll get someone who will write you like, you know, 40 paragraphs on like everything they said. And you can caution them, hey, you know, just so you know, you don't have to, you don't have to tell them everything at once, bite-sized chunks, um, but let people feel like they want to have that conversation instead of them being sold about something. Yeah. yeah. Do you need a technological mechanism for the um, for measuring the rippling effect? So especially over generations two and three. Generations two and three are, are uh, we don't even know generation three yet. So we, but G one and G two, um, you do in some senses. I, I'd like to say we we're far enough advanced. You could probably do it in other ways. I'll tell you how we're. I'll tell you how Northeastern actually the university is doing studies is doing it. They're giving, and actually this could be replicated, so this would be interesting. And if people do this, we want the data, so. So, so you probably do some direct mailings, or you do some, people could pick up something at an event. On, on, when we send out kits for our campaigns to, to an individual, we include a card that says, we're doing a study, we want to know how far word of mouth spreads. If you tell somebody else about this, give them the card. On the back of the card it says, come log in here, you can do it through, through email again, Fill out a survey, when did you hear about this? What did you think? Did you pass this message on to somebody else? Now we're getting to G1. And then we tell that person, if you tell somebody else about this, give them the card. So what they're doing, and we're doing this for hundreds of thousands of people over time, is that card starts to pass along and we start to see how far, because then that person comes in and fills out their report when we got it, right? Yeah, it's good. Time. So you can thank Dr. Walter Crowell at Northeastern if you, if you did it too. Um, so, so that's a pretty simple one. It just include a little card, put some messaging on the back, and you'll probably start to see a little bit of, of traction. I'd actually be interested, you know, we're, we've got this 1.65 metric, 1.7 metric. For nonprofits, it might be 20, it might be one, right? We would be interested to see how it changes by category. Yeah. yeah. I think she's going to go first and then we'll come back. Very hypothetically, in a hypothetical organization that has a long and difficult name, I'm wondering how important the name is to generating word of mouth. So say that again. So so let's say there was an organization for, with a really long name. Yeah, let's just say that. Let's just say it. Yeah. For the moment. For the moment. How do we counteract that via word of mouth? Yes. Change the name. <laughs> Thanks. Or you can ask people what they would recommend. Then you involve Do we need to change the name? Sorry. <laughs> Another ten-year discussion. <laughs> yeah. um, no question. Yeah. I just wondered if you could comment on sort of the most receptive target audience for Buzz. It's got to be there. Have to be some generational um, issues or challenges or uh, right. envelope. To right. This. So, so who is the most important people to, to generate word mouth or to target when you're talking about word mouth? Um, so an interesting thing in our system, our system grows organically, we don't market for people to join. 70% of the people in the system are women. And now I like to say it's because men are so emotionally repressed, they don't like to talk about it. <laughs> but, but it is, you know, women are making a lot of decisions for households, they're, they're sort of driving the economy at this point. Um, so women is, is a huge, huge target. Now we talk about things called communities of influence. Um, and I'll use, I suppose, a really a sort of an obscure example, but one that you, we want you to think about when you're thinking about doing this. Let's say you were looking to target some big shot to fund something in your organization. Some big CEO somewhere, you know he's got cash, you know, and he could do this, but you can't get to him. Now, you want to use word of mouth to get him to pay attention to this. Now, a lot of, a lot of companies come to us and say, so we better engage other CEOs, because CEOs only talk to CEOs, and that's how it's going to work. But the reality is you want to think about who that CEO is getting information from. 
right? He's going home at night or she's going home at night talking to their spouse. His kids probably give him some information. His assistants, his coworkers, his other executive staff. So when we build campaigns, we think about all the people around an individual to give them the, the information to bring to the individual, right? When we talk to B2B companies, they talk about buying million dollar packages, huge Siebel Oracle systems. They never say, another CEO told me, they always say, oh yeah, this engineer in, in, in the tech department told me about this, right? It's never maybe who you'd expect. So, and it changes by product category, so I, I wouldn't say there's any sort of always this case, but think about the people around who you're trying to target. And you'll start to recognize there's some patterns. It's not, you know, people don't only talk to people like them. Yeah. So when you do work for Red Cross, for instance, yeah. do you use the, the, the network of volunteers and donors they already had to be worried about people, or did you go outside of that, that um, Right, so so did we use people within the association? So we haven't worked with the Red Cross, although that's a nice idea. Right, so for March of Dimes or Blue Peace Foundation. So um, in some cases, yes. Um, the programs we run are really, we try to make it as simple as possible. We go out to the volunteer, our volunteer base. Who who wants to help? You get hands galore go up. People, people just love to do this. So, um, you know, we haven't, although for a lot of companies, we do what you're talking about. You've got this community, you've got this group, you kind of don't know what to do with them, you keep mailing in, you're trying to get them to come in for stuff. You know, is there a way to use a system like ours to invite them in and take part in the programs? And yeah, that happens, that happens often for us. So, um, and the interesting thing is you find the people in the association or, or the group who've already experienced the product next to the people we have who may not have yet, and we have to educate about the product itself, they act very differently. Um, you know, it, it's sort of a, where they are in sort of the scale of, of knowledge and how they're creating word of mouth is really different. Sometimes the people who haven't experienced it before, the newness makes them accelerate much quicker than the people who've already experienced it. It's really kind of fascinating. Okay. Yeah. Um, for someone who's a light loyal or perhaps unfamiliar with your organization, what do you do to motivate them? Um, so I'll use the rock bottom example. Um, in that case, the light loyals could join the program. They already had, a lot of people already had cards, very much like that example where, where you're already bringing people in. And we gave them a $15 appetizer to, to take part in the program. Um, in a case like this, it might be give somebody a big discount coming into an event or you know, let them, let them you know, get one of the materials you provide out, um, you know, uh, discount for helping. And there is a, there is a piece of this, um, we call the reciprocity theory, or it's been called there forever. If you give somebody something, they feel indebted to you. Right? The, the sort of wide known case for this um, is the Hare Krishnas, um, who used to, was a failing organization, they don't know the Hare Krishnas, they walk around, they ask for donations, I don't know. Okay, so but this, is, this is the case, this is what happened, they were a failing organization, they totally were falling apart, they couldn't figure it out, and then one person was like, well why don't we give people flowers, and you know, who knows? So they gave people flowers, and then, and as soon as they gave someone a flower, they gave them money because they felt they got it. So that changed the entire organization. They became just low inside information. <laughs> There's deception for you. So, but anyway, reciprocity, give them something. Look, we know your time is valuable. Your opinion is so important to us. I mean, we're going to send you this. We want it to change what we're doing. So, we have sort of a wide variety of tools we'll use to do this, but they, they relatively fit within a, a, a spectrum. What we do in every case is we give people enough to feel that they can become an expert, right? So we, when you have money and give them enough facts, just so you, when someone asks you about the association, you want to, you don't want to sound like you don't know what you're talking about. So here's all the information you might need. That's you probably have developed all that for other things, and then we give them the sort of conceptual word of mouth things they need to know, and they come in seven categories. Um, you, you should write these down because they're important. I probably have some examples, but buzz triggers. When are the right times to create word and help us targets? Who are the right people to talk to? Activities, give them some ideas of things they could do, right? Post a blog, talk to your friends at another association. Just give them some things to get conceptually in the know. Um, buzz stories, this is perhaps the most important thing we talk about. When people share things about one of your associations, they don't read off the back of the you know, of the brochure, um, they don't try to say the name if it's, if it's hard to say, um, but what they do is share an experience that they've had. It's all personal stuff. I went to that event, 
and it was really good or really bad. I got this thing, and it really taught me something new. And so what we give people in every sort of training mechanism is, what are the stories you might want to think about telling? Right? Um, you know, Nike's not a client, but they come to us and say, um, we want to tell everybody to just do it. Nobody reads the tagline, what they say is, these shoes help me win the marathon. Right? So think about the things that people might say once they've experienced your product, and help them understand those are the types of things that you want them to pass on, what are their own experiences. I didn't get all seven, but we'll figure it out. What else? Other questions? Comments? Concerns? How do you become one of your pro bono agents? Bono agents. Just sign up. Yeah. <laughs> you sign up. Buzzagent.com. B-Z-Z-A-G-E-N-T.com. Sign on up. Anyone can get in. You have to be over 13, I think. Everyone's over 13 in the room. Um, agents rates 13 to 89. All walks of life. We have something for everybody. So we'll just sign up. Yeah. Yeah. How, how did you find those people that you and, and how should we find them if we don't want to use the people that are already in our organization? Right. So this is a that's a really good question because it's I don't have a perfect answer for this. The hardest part of this is finding that starting point. Now for for the Frog King for the book, we told family and friends, and then it started to act a little virally on its own. But it wasn't you know you hear about these things you know yesterday we, we launched this and you know, 21 people showed up. It wasn't that case. It took us a long time. The first year, we only had a couple thousand people. We, we just let it build organically on its own. It was, it was a little painful, but um, now that we understand why it worked that way, um, it's, been, it's been better for the business. So what I say is there, you're, there's probably a lot of people around you you could just reach out to, family and friends. Um, let it start slowly. Anybody who joins, embrace them. Give them something. Um, let them, if you, if you think about it, what would you get? What would you want to hear that would make you come and really join us? Right? What would make you do that? If you can, if you can conceptualize that, you give that to other people, you will see they will turn around and tell somebody else to join, and then it will start to grow organically. Um, so make it an experience, make it something fun, don't make it a job for them, um, and they'll, uh, they'll start to do things under that. What else? Other questions? So you said that the traditional media and stuff like that is really important to give you a base if you work out and whatnot. What I mean, so it seems like the, you know the Papa John's thing that was like really good for creating more talk. What what are some examples of things that you know are a good base to sort of then uh, to move on? Yeah. So what other types of traditional media? Right. So I think it's. You know, this is really hard for a lot of marketers we deal with. They're spending lots of money and they create things that they know really probably aren't effective, but they look cool and flashy, and so they do it anyway, right? Um, I wouldn't say it's any specific type of thing, but thinking about something that they'd have to turn around and tell someone else. So some TV commercials do it, right? Some are really boring, we don't pay attention to them. Did anyone happen to see the Spike Jones Gap commercial where they trash a Gap store? Did you see this? They, they, they actually have to see this, right? They get that smile when they see it. They accidentally, supposedly accidentally released it on the web and everyone saw it. But it's this fascinating where they're redoing Gap and they film these guys just destroying the Gap store. It's really funny. Look it up online on YouTube for 1.65 million. <laughs> but, um, but uh, you know, so, so it's create, it's not saying none of those tools could have the thing that could get somebody to pass on to someone else. It's using the tool effectively, right? So the traditional Gap commercials no one really started paying attention to them anymore. We've seen that before. They did that slow motion dancing thing. It was like the Matrix. It was really interesting. But now it's not. Right? When they did the Matrix thing, it was really interesting. Right? So, so now they've done this thing where they're demolishing stores. That's one step there. Um, now, I went, just as an aside, I went and spoke at Gap about a year ago when this came out. Mm -hmm. All the executives, nobody even knew that commercial existed. Right. They had no idea. So I'm sitting there and telling them how great it is, and they're like, we don't even know that. Okay? <laughs> to show, and, and that's something really important. A lot of people forget to pay attention to their employees, the people who go home on the weekends, and the first things their friends say to them is, how's, how's the gap? Right? How's the association? Right? You're the people who can carry the most knowledge to the people around you, and some companies just totally forget to pay attention to them. So um, I chastise gap for it, and they forget. <laughs> What else? Any other questions? Yeah. What about saturation? I mean, 
what if everybody, you know, was so inspired by your talk today, uh, gets this idea? Have you had any experience in the markets where there are a lot of buzz campaigns going on at the same time? Um, so here's what we found. Um, there is a saturation question, right? There's, there's only 220,000 buzz agents. There's 300 million people in the U.S. We're, we're far away from a real U.S. saturation point. Um, what we found is no matter how many programs we offer to individuals in our system, they typically will join four a year. Now there's people who will join seven and people who join one. But if you give the opportunity to self, you know, say, I want self opt in, I opt in only when I want, 